Hello and welcome back to Breakfast of Boots. I'm your host, Becca Boots, and today is the second part of the 10-part series where I speak to awesome people in my network who live and breathe well-being and happiness in all that they do. Now today I have a very special guest for you. I have Sam Moyne. Now I'm particularly excited about this one because this is the first real face-to-face conversation that me and Sam have had. Now Sam is a speaker, he is a teacher, and he's the founder of Student Breakthrough. Let me bring him in. Hi Sam, thank you so much for being here. Now I've been following you on LinkedIn for about God, about over a year now, and it's so good to have this opportunity to chat with you. So for those who don't know you, welcome, and would you like to tell everyone a bit more about you and what you do? Yeah, Becca, thank you so much. Um, I'm really, really grateful to be on your podcast. Thank you so much. Um, So yeah, for people that don't know me, my name's Sam Moyne. I'm a teacher, a speaker, a student life coach, and founder of a business called Student Breakthrough. And we aim to revolutionize emotional support for young people and create lasting change for future generations. Nice, lovely. Nice and succinct there, to the point, boom. (laughs) (laughs) I like it, very well delivered. Uh, How did you actually come to find this path? Because I've not, like, my, what I know about your business is incredible in the sense of why wasn't this there when we were students? So something I think is really huge is we, when we're students, are making massive decisions at like 16 years old that shape our entire lives they they move us in a certain direction and I've never heard of an academic life coach before so tell me how did you come along and find this path so my path into coaching was you know totally not planned um, for many many years I, well, I did never wanted to get into education never wanted to get into coaching I wanted to be a soldier and that was my dream from about 10 years old um, my dad was a Royal Marine and he fought in the Falklands War in the 80s. All my family history is in the military. So as a young man, I looked up to my dad and I think all boys do generally, like want to follow in their dad's footsteps. My father never told me to join the military, but I, I, it was my belief that I took on, a lie that I took on that I had to go and do it. So um, my dream came true in 2012. I got accepted into the Royal Anglian Regiment. So, so, so excited. Ran up to my dad with this letter from the the regiment saying, look, I'm in, they want me. I cried, it was just a really emotional time because I'd finally achieved my dream or what I thought was my dream. Uh, Becca, but then two weeks later, I got thrown a curveball and I got another letter through the post. It said, Sam, unfortunately you will not be considered for selection because you've been diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So in that moment, if you listen to this and you've had a dream, like that was my dream for my whole life and it got taken away from me instantly. And it made me feel like a victim for many years. It's something I don't really do anymore, but it was like, why have I got Crohn's? Why has this happened to me? Why can't I do what I want to do? And it led me to feel really anxious, really low. And I didn't really have another, a plan B, basically. That was my plan A, plan B, plan C was to go and be a soldier. Um, So I just fast forward, I got into, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I thought, you know what? I love history. My mum was a teacher let's go and get some skills. Let's just go and become a teacher and it'll give us me like a great foundation for the rest of my life. And I became a history teacher and I really didn't like it that much. Um, It was because I felt like I wasn't doing what I was put on this earth to do, which was to go and be a soldier. I was actually confined to these four walls of a classroom. It got so bad that some days when I was teaching, I'd like turn away from the, the students and I'd be like welling up. You know, I wasn't sleeping. I was a wreck. And when, sometimes when you're at the bottom of the mountain, there's only one way up. And I got in contact with a coach um, on the 23rd of April, 2015. Wow. So about five years ago to the day. Yeah, near, give or take five years ago. Um, I remember the day so well, it's ingrained in my brain because it transformed my life. It might sound cliche, but it was almost like my perspective and I see perspective as like almost like a wedding, like a, a veil on a wedding dress, right? Your perspective, how you see the world. It was very gray and dark before this point. And it was almost like the veil was lifted off and the whole world was like technicolored and vibrant for the first time. And I just felt alive with everything. So I had a really transformational experience with coaching and I then became a much better teacher. 
and I fell in love with the job. Like I still love teaching history. I get to do it now and again, which is amazing still. Um, but I saw so many students who were struggling with their mental health. So many students who were not getting support. And if they were getting support, I felt that it was the wrong type of support. Um, so that's basically how this whole journey started from me having that experience to then seeing, well, how can we contribute to more students with coaching? And then I got involved in it that way. So it was all over failure and organic. You know, I, just, I didn't wake up and say I wanted to do this. It was kind of life like pushed me into it. And I'm uh, so grateful for everything, even my Crohn's disease. Yeah. I love that. So interesting, isn't it? That small, like little things, like even to a point of like small little decisions, how they can completely alter the direction of your life. That's it's mad. Like it's mad. And now I'm really engaged with failure. And that in that coaching experience, that was the first time I engaged with my failure and my setbacks. Mm. It, was a, it was a massive experience. Like it's a great experience to me in so many ways because I didn't feel like the victim anymore. Mm. I felt like, this has happened to me and I'm actually growing and learning from it for the first time. Um, you know, as a young man, I was 23 at the time, like expressing and not suppressing. I say that all the time to kids, right? <laughs> express, don't suppress what you feel was also really important um, to actually get stuff off my chest. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, the actual gem, which was, well, this has really worked. This has really helped me. Let's go and help kids and students and young people with this. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, massively. So where does your role fit within school? So in terms of, um, I, I remember when I was in school, um, I had a career um, person that I used to go into the office to and chat to, but it wasn't really a massive um, help. That everything they were trying, but, <laughs> but I think it wasn't much awareness at that point. Um, so where does your role fit into the school system? So I never, again, I never wanted to coach in schools either. Right. Um, you know, when I left teaching, I was like, I'm never going back into the class, <laughs> into the schools. Like I want to have a pina colada sitting on a beach in Bali, like coaching wherever I want, you know, all this kind of, you know, literally pipe dreams I felt. Um, and I'm so glad it changed. Um, and I was really struggling financially in my first year of my business. Um, and we, you know, I, I was going to get a supply teaching job again. I was really, really low, really, really down. And a school got me in to teach the First World War, which was my, it's my speciality. We have a couple of artifacts here at home. So we bring them in, we get the kids, get their hands on them. It's amazing lessons. So I did 10 hours teaching for free that week. Wow. Again, what you put out is what you get back. Yeah. On the Friday, the head teacher grabs me and says, Sam, we'd love for you to coach our year 11 pupil premium students. So these are free school meal kids. Right. Um, so the government give them some funding. Yeah. And that was a massive blessing. So my role in school at the moment is really going in and working with students who haven't necessarily had the best time in life. They might be looked after children, They're like I say, pupil premium students, or students who are high ability but just feel pressure and stress. Mm. Um, so we kind of come in with the, I like to say alternative support in some ways. All our team are really relatable. We're fairly young. Um, our approach is really positive and present focused. So we don't deal, deal with the past too much, which I, I believe students really enjoy in lots of ways so yeah we go into schools do speaking gigs we run workshops in schools for, for teachers and parents and students and also we do our one-on-one -on -one coaching so yeah. we sort of run parallel to the other support that's in school okay. Um, okay. yeah but we kind of fit in that way but it's been it's been so rewarding working with those types of students you know students who've been in care like they're the ones that need someone to believe in them yeah that's it's so important so yeah that's our role really mm -hmm. and that's so important i i um I went to this TED talk before about a year or two ago and he was talking about foster care children and how when they leave the system, a lot of them leave without any kind of um, anyone to rely on, any kind of obviously parents to back up to go and live with. And a lot of people in the care system end up being homeless or working in the sex industry, which is incredibly sad when you think about that. So actually having that opportunity to work with children in care at that age in school is an incredible thing to do. Yeah, it's massively important. Like you know, they haven't got that support um, and they really, really love, love the program because they just, they've got someone there who's, who's there for them for the whole year, mm. who doesn't leave them, who've got access to us at all times if they need to catch up. Mm. Um, so it's a whole, we've changed our approach from going to schools, working with kids for six weeks, which is great. You get a result, but then you leave. Mm. And for students who are in care, like that's, that's not, 
really approach. So now we extend our program for the whole year. So we're working with these students for the whole year, um, just making them feel successful, you know, more happy and confident. Amazing. And have you, so obviously I've, in my day back then, I probably wouldn't have been able to appreciate the gravity of what I was being offered if that had to come into my life. Do you get students that, um, like, is it a range of how they kind of interact with it or are they <laughs> open to kind of expressing their emotions? Um, the first session is always really, really fun. Hmm. I say fun because it's always interesting, let's say. So let's be honest, no student really wants to wake up one day and say, you know what, mum, I want to be coached by Sam at Student Breakthrough. Or, you know what, um, Mrs. Cheatham, I'm really, Mrs. Cheatham, I'm really, really struggling with my mental health. I want to be coached by Student Breakthrough. That never happens. But the first session, we kind of quash like all their, all their worries or their concerns about the program. You know, is this going to be loads of revision? Is it like tuition? Is it counselling? And it's not that. And they, mm -hmm. they generally fall in love with it because unlike teaching or parenting where it's top down, it's like, Becca, you will do this, right? That's generally how they're spoken to lots of the time. Like I'm in control. I'm going to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. A student breakthrough, it's totally on the same level. Okay. So we're like, teammates so they see it as almost like a, a joint venture in, in their own emotional well-being so again if you use like a football analogy it's like i'm the midfielder and i'm passing the ball and they're the striker so i'm not on the sideline telling them what to do i'm just like giving them a bit of direction and they love that because they're taking ownership big work ownership for their life and it's really really exciting to watch them do that but the first session yeah you just they end up falling in love with the program um and we've, we've had some amazing results because again we, we don't we never tell we just ask and it's a massive difference yeah it's much more empowering isn't it because i suppose what the way i look at what you do as well you don't just set them up to kind of deal with school better and deal with their emotions as a teenager you set them up for whole their whole life to kind of then apply that and empower them to know that they've done this once before and they know what to do and they they when they look back in the future, they can say, oh, I've done this before. I know I can do it. Yeah. Like that's the thing we, we, we got in that first school that I was in with the pupil premium students in year 11. Like these are the worst performing students in the year group. They all hate school. have done for, again, those beliefs they've had about school have been there since they were like four or five years old. Um, and if I was going in there and you know, they've got money to spend on extra English and maths, which is important, but if they hate school, they don't like academics. I would argue that is a, a way, not a waste of money, but you could spend it in better ways, giving them some life skills, helping them to take ownership and revise a little bit more. And we did all of this. And well, I say we, they did all of this because they set their own action steps. So it is a different approach. And you can't obviously do it in the classroom with 30 people. You can't say, what do you guys want to do? Because it'd be uproar. But the one-on-one -on -one in the workshops, you can have that more kind of heartfelt, centered, um, empowered approach uh, to help them. Yeah, I love that. And your, your package with your coaching is built around the three B's, isn't it? And I can see them behind you. So your boost, your believe and your breakthrough. Um, can you get me a little bit more understanding around those? Yeah, sure. So the three B's uh, are a coaching program, nice. boost, believe and breakthrough. So the program we've made, what I've made is a combination of, of life coaching principles of the stuff I've learned in teaching, um, my own personal development journey and what I've taken away. But we call it this boost believe breakthrough in boost we help students with their motivation we help them uh, create a vision for what they want to achieve we help them really understand their strengths and weaknesses so they do get a bit of a boost and obviously they're talking about those problems for the first time so it gives them that boost and they start taking action steps uh, in believe we look at stuff like limiting beliefs their values um I'm trying to think of some more stuff we do this great exercise called the tree of life, which is just like a massively positive exercise that makes them really appreciate, you know, their, what they've achieved so far and what people appreciate about them. Um, so they start believing in themselves here when they look, you look at, you know, what is potentially holding them back and how to overcome it. And in breakthrough, we do stuff like leadership, resilience, um, relationships, empathy. So by this stage, and it's a 10 session course, by this stage, they trust you, they trust the program and they start getting some really, really big results. Mm. but it's a slow process some people you know think that i mean someone said i thought you were like the student tony robbins and like i'm not a guru like and i 
people sometimes expect this is going to be a fast, quick result. And it's, it's never, you know this, like with mental health and emotional support, it's never made a wave a magic wand and your problems are solved mm-hmm. or putting a, a bandage on a wound. It's not like that. It takes time to heal. It takes mm-hmm. time to actually trust the process and start getting results. So yeah, we get results for every single student we work with. And I can hand on my heart say that. Um, and this program has been massively uh, important in helping those students. Yeah. Absolutely. When when I th- when I hear you say it, it seems so logical that you would have emotional and academic education together. Like it just it, yeah. That- I mean, the problem we've got in education is if you think of a house with the recent curriculum changes, we built this house on like the weakest foundations possible. Now they were weak before the curriculum changes. So the curriculum changes meant when I was teaching history, I'd be teaching give or take some A level stuff to a thirteen or fourteen year old. It massively like ups the, the difficulty of the of the content. They up you know the actual amount that students had to write in the exam and stuff like this. So what we've done, we've put loads of pressure from the top down. So much pressure these students are facing right now, and it is hard. By the way, these are like hard exams. Mm-hmm. What we used to teach was so much easier, but we haven't done anything underneath. So we haven't put any like mindset or strategies to overcome anxiety or confidence there's nothing on the bottom so what you're facing is students who are feeling more pressure but they've got no way to actually express themselves or deal with it and we're only about two or three years into the new curriculum and when i was teaching it was a massive reason why i left because we're not giving the students the you know solid foundation because if you're going to put pressure in the top you need to have that strong base otherwise the whole house is going to fall down um so yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's that's amazing that and you that's a really great analogy as well so do you do you find that teachers are really on board with what you do do you or do you find that is there any kind of level of um defensiveness where they feel that they're they're not doing a, a right job or are they on board and like yes that's exactly what we need i've done a couple of school talks to staff <laughs> and at times it's been quite hostile i would describe it the uh the mood in the room um i get up in front of these teachers some of who have been in education for 30 40 years i'm fairly young i've left the system i've run a business i'm trying to help in a different way and some people are quite resistant to it i'm going to be really honest which is is sad um because what we're doing here is actually giving skills for life that is appropriate for 2020 now the flip side is you get some amazing staff who love this growth mindset stuff who love a more positive approach who love like different approaches to help their students and you know, some head teachers, some SLT senior leaders have been so welcoming. And we're actually training an assistant head on one of our programs to actually use this stuff. And um, we went in and worked with his primary school students. And they were year, t- year five, so 10 year olds. And uh, they got some great results. And he was like, well, can I come on the training program? So I was like, yeah, sure. So that's another great aim is, is training those enthusiastic teachers across the UK, which is what we're doing to deliver the program. So yeah, there's some resistance. There always will be in education. But also there's some really, really amazing, inspirational people who want to do stuff differently. And uh, yeah, I'm so grateful to those people. Awesome. And it's so good that you're training them as well. So you're not just delivering it. You're not just delivering it from the outside. You're training them so that they can embed it then within the culture of the school as well. Yeah. Like, again, it's all organic. And I never sat down to think I'm going to train people. Um, I ran a Facebook ad literally this time last year, maybe a bit in March sorry, last year for parents. So I was trying to find parents to coach their their, their children. Mm. And this uh, lady in Wales saw it, which I always remember the conversation because I was actually on a ferry from Dover to Calais on a school trip. And she calls me up, you know, the classic going to the first little battlefields. Excuse me. And she calls me up in a Welsh accent. She's from Swansea. She's like, hello, hello, I love what you're doing. I love what you're doing. I want to get involved. I'm like, whoa. Like she's so enthusiastic. And a bit like Richard Branson says, I was always like, you know, say yes and work it out later. So I was like, yeah, I can, I can train you. We can do something. So it all came from this place of just, yeah, like organic kind of just wanting to get involved in the program. Um, so I created a training program. It was just me and Joe and I trained Joe and just one-on-one. And since then we've trained up to 13 people now. So our latest cohort has got four teachers on it, I think. So the groups are still quite small, but um, yeah, they get trained in the whole boost blue breakthrough thing. Um, and they're in our coaching family, coaching community um, to help more young people. So yeah, you train the teachers, you get them on board and then yes, it's a small impact. 
but Joe has now been helping students who were too nervous, anxious, didn't leave the house. They weren't going to college to get an education and now they're getting an education. So even if we're helping one student in South Wales, like that's still aligned with my values of what we're doing here and what we want to achieve. Um, so that's been a really, really fun part. And I think because the teaching part of me, like I love educating people in, in this and what we do, uh, it just comes really naturally. And yeah, I love it because it still gives me that education buzz mm. um, that I don't get anymore, I guess. Awesome. And how do you feel like, so obviously we've talked about the parents and the students, how they engage. How about the, um, the sorry, the teachers and the students, how about the parents? How are they engaging with them? Yeah, the parents, generally really really love it um you know there's nothing uh i get quite emotional sometimes because you know we really help some students who have been really really low like um always remember one guy called jamie who's still a great uh great student he uh i met him the day that he tried to take his own life and it was a really really emotional time that session i've never hugged a student before in a session but I hugged this guy and we cried together and then his parents were crying and uh, I hugged them as well and it was this really transformational process but I think when you help someone like that then it's invaluable it's almost priceless um I'm not saying I'm like Gandhi or Martin Luther King or anyone like this but we met this student at the right place at the right time and I was I'd I guess skilled enough to take him through the process and his mum and dad are forever like so so grateful and he signed up again for some more coaching um so parents are like really really engaged with it because you know our program is x amount of money and you can spend x amount of money on a phone a laptop whatever you want but if you know i'd argue helping someone overcome suicide or getting them an education or um just feeling better about themselves from a young age like is that not priceless yeah. Is that not like the most important thing to spend money on? So parents are really generally awesome. We've run lots of events for parents because you can have the best teacher, mentor, coach in the whole world. But if your mum and dad are not on board or if your mum and dad um, are using like language, that's holding them back and holding you back, then you're not going to get very far. Mm. So we run events for parents. Again, I'm not a parent. I never say I'm an expert in parenting, but I'm an expert in coaching kids and teaching kids. So I give them that different approach. Um, really it's about listening and communicating with their with their children on a better level on a deeper level um, and we haven't run one in a while but we used we run two family events so we have about six or seven families in a room for a whole day and it's like family personal development so we do lots of like outcome setting um, communication empathy and they all leave just setting like family outcomes and how to like work together on new stuff as a family so after lockdown's finished, that's going to be the first event I think I want to run again, the family ones. That's awesome. Oh, it gives me goosebumps. I love it. I love things like this because it, it reminds me of something my friend said to me um, a few weeks ago. I was, I just obviously come back from holiday. I was struggling to kind of think, oh, right, we're in lockdown now. And um, I had a bit of a kind of writer's block and a bit of a block about how I could help people. Because you kind of feel this weight, don't you, of like, um, of seeing so many people in front of you that need that support and being like I need to help them I need to help them now and he said to me if you can just change one person then you're changing the world and like that like and I that was so profound for me like just try and do one person every day and it reminds me of the quote I've still got it on my wall actually which um, <laughs> we said on LinkedIn um, you told me it's just about showing up with purpose and intention to do your best every day. And that I that. Yeah, that's what you said, you wise, wise old man. <laughs> <laughs> but I've still got that here and that, that, that is incredible to like, to be able to do that for a student and then to be able to do that for his whole, their whole family as well. That is massive. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, and he did a big, again, like from someone who was there, on a bridge in Milton Keynes. Three months later, he was doing a speaking gig in front of 40 people at our biggest event in London about his story and his journey. Like, this guy's 14 years old, speaking in front of 40 adults, and the whole room was moved. And he's a little bit young, but we take some students who've, gone, who've been coaching our program and we put them onto our coach training program. So these are students who've gone through the three Bs, overcome some challenges, 
and love coaching, want to give back. So the business the way it was going before this was we training these students as public speakers, as leaders, as people who can run workshops and actually coach. So they can then go in and help more young people. So it's kind of a, a constant cycle of improvement. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm going to be connected to that family for the rest of my life. It's, uh, it's a, it does give me goosebumps. And if the business went, it's just business just failed today. I know that I've, it's, it's worked because I've helped that one person at least. And if that was my biggest thing with starting this whole thing, I remember doing my first video. I had to get coached on videos. So I was so like nervous, right? And like a couple of years ago, it was every like entrepreneur is when they got to start doing content and stuff. Yeah. And I wrote this quote down. It was like, if this video helps one person, then it's been a success. Yeah. And I love what your friend said there. Like if you're helping one person with your content, then that's the aim. Don't think about likes or follows or all this crap. Like, just who's the one person that can help and benefit. And that quote was great. So it's showing up a purpose. I like that one. I need yeah, to, I love to it. be reminded of that myself. Yeah, I like <laughs> Remember your own wisdom. Yeah, no, it's, it is incredible. And it's, but it's a, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? To, um, if you change just one person, but having the whole challenge of teenagers when um, your brain is still developing, You've got a hurricane of emotions going on. So to make an impact in the student's life is huge. What, what do you find is the biggest challenge when working with teenagers? It obviously depends on every student. Mm. You've got the severe stuff. Like we spoke about suicide, self-harm. Yeah. Nothing. Um, drugs, gangs we've worked on. They're like the extreme end of the spectrum. Um, coaching a student at the moment on bereavement. So he had someone who's actually one of his parents passed away, but he never really engaged with it. Okay, like I did. He's never really talked about it. So we're working with him on that. Generally speaking, I'd argue it's like, well, I'd, I'd say it's probably like the C word, which is confidence, um, which I'm massively interested in. Mm. And we do lots of a kind of a different approach with confidence. So it's usually confidence. I guess anxiety, just self-esteem. Um, as one lad working with, he's actually signed up for a second round of coaching, which is awesome. Um, he is lovely, lovely boy, a bit autistic, really struggled socially. Like he'd eat his lunch in the library every single day. And he loves his books. And he's like such an amazing guy. He loves history as well, by the way. So we got on straight away. But he had no friends. And he really struggled to make human connections. Now, obviously, parents are worried about that because he's not going to be at school all the time. He's going to eventually have to make social connections. Um, and for him, again, it was setting action steps to go and speak to like one new person a day. And all of a sudden he was getting at the library, not every single day, but like two or three times a week. And he had some new friends and he was going to different places. And again, like for a mum, it's massive for that. Like, you know, and so it does range on every, every person, but really we help kids. If you strip it all away, we help kids become leaders. And I don't mean leaders as in captain of a sports team or giving a rousing speech. I'm talking leadership of their own lives, like taking responsibility for themselves. I used that word ownership a while ago because um, they're setting their own action steps and following through on them. And we're kind of there just a guide. They feel empowered that they're doing all the work, which let's be honest, they are 80 to 20. I'd say they're doing all the work. Um, I can't remember what's going with this, but that's why we get results. Yeah. And that's why every person's different, but ultimately we build leadership and responsibility in students. Yeah. Yeah. That's massive. And, and I think it's that, that key of understanding you've got responsibility for your own life is a massive thing because I work with adults on the opposite end of the spectrum who haven't done that work when they were younger and are not able to take responsibility yet for themselves. And it's like, almost unlearning what you've learned before and relearning the good stuff. And that you, you have actually have a, um, a quote on your website from Frederick Douglass. I don't know if you remember it. Yes. It's easier Great quote. to build strong children than to repair broken adults. I use that quote all the time. I actually found it in a book. You should check this book out for listening. It's called 13 things that mentally strong parents don't do. Mm. Um, and I love it in a book. Like, I don't really remember much of that book, but the intro of that book had that quote and it was like, boom, wisdom just hit me. And I was like, oh my God, like that's literally what we do. 
every time I stand up and say that quote, every time I say it in networking, at uh, talk, every time I share it, it gets like unbelievable traction because it's so, so true. Uh, because that's what I was going through. You know, it was easy to build strong children and repair broken adults. Now I was strong, but I hadn't engaged with that failure. So in my twenties, although I looked like happy and confident and teaching all this stuff inside, I was actually like my, you know, my inner child was hurt. You know, I didn't had didn't have the strategy to engage with failure and I felt like a, you know, a victim. But if we can help students to actually become stronger from a young age mentally, then it's going to make, imagine the impact on the workforce, imagine the impact on university, the rest of their lives, all this stuff. Yeah. If you can give them those skills from a young age. Um, and unfortunately there's too many students who are not offered that support. And I feel everyone needs this support, but it's how we, how we get that across is, is the next step. Um, yeah it's a great quote yeah i love it absolutely love it and it's so true because i've seen and i do a mental health support work as well and i've seen in people in like case files how there's so many ways along the journey that they've been failed they've been failed by the school system they've been failed by the whatever system they've hit along the way so to interrupt that before it gets too late is is key absolutely key yeah and again like that's, that's the problem with students in care you know they have been let down they've been failed lots of times um it might not have been anyone's fault but unfortunately that's just the way it is and that's why having someone who believes in them from a young age who's there for them as their guide their coach whatever um will give them at least you know one two percent at least of like a life score they can take away with them and isn't that better than nothing you know, but it's about being relatable. That's the big thing. Everyone we hire has to be relatable. They have to be in education. They have to be a teacher of some sort or a sports coach to really understand young people. It's not Joe Bloggs off the street. We want people who are relatable, who care. And we've got this great little coaching family that's starting to develop all across the UK. Um, and we'll see where it goes. You know, the aim is to have this globally. And we got uh, just finishing actually this week, our first ever US client um, who's in New Jersey, <laughs> um, great great guy and uh yeah so we're slowly slowly kind of spreading out a little bit helping more people which is really cool awesome awesome now going back to um what you were saying about confidence and the little activities you do to help them build it so sort of talking to one person a day and things like that um it actually triggered a memory of have you heard of rejection proof no, I can't say I have. Jia Jiang, I think you say his name like, um, where basically he, he looks for rejection. And so he goes out because he, he realized he had really low levels of confidence. And so he went on this challenge to do 100 days of rejection, where every day he would go and put himself in a situation where he'd get rejected. So basically he would build up this immunity towards it. And mm. And um, one thing's we're like talking to random people, like, uh, you know, asking people to go and play foot, knocking on people's doors and asking to play football in their garden. Like the most ridiculous ones or asking, like go, walking into Domino's and asking if he can go and deliver the pizzas for them. Like just random and some really, really funny ones as well. And I did that for 30 days, which was, did you? yeah, <laughs> really fun. Um, wow. And, um, and I've got some videos on it on my YouTube and I even did a stand up comedy <laughs> night. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, but um, that I think being comfortable with being rejected is mm. such a huge thing for adults, never mind children. So actually pulling them forward and saying, look, go and speak to one person a day. You're not, you're helping them build confidence, but also making them feel comfortable about potentially being rejected. Yeah. Well, really well put. Becca, that was awesome. Um, I wanted to try that to be fair because rejection is my biggest thing I struggle with. Um, I did a disc profile a couple of weeks ago and mine was like big influence. So mm -hmm. I love being around people, love being likes, love being like, you know, you know, I guess kind of uh, got a team around me as well, that kind of thing. So I'm big, big on teamwork and stuff like that. And I know rejection is a massive thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, as it is for many people, I think, you know, many people get hurt by even the smallest things. Um, and I still do. I'm going to be really vulnerable here. We've made a new online program and a school that really wanted it just weren't getting back to me. And last week I got really kind of just frustrated, caught up in my thinking, which we all do sometimes. But it was, I, I, looked, I asked myself this question yesterday. I had a coaching call with my coach and I was like, I've just been focusing too much on my human experience without, we call it looking upstream. So basically what's really going on? What's behind this? And for me, it was just 
I just felt rejected. I felt hurt. Like I've gone away and done all this stuff, created this new course, and they're not getting back to me. And uh, you know, it's not it's not their fault to do that. You know, necessarily, it's it's it's, it's me that's bringing that on. And having that awareness is so important. But yeah, the confidence one. I'm still trying to crack this because I see confidence as something that we all have innate in us. Like, I'm pretty sure, Becky, you're confident in drinking water, right? Yeah. <laughs> pretty sure. Like, if you're like me, I'm, I'm quite confident eating cake. I'm quite confident in that. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm confident at speaking, coaching, teaching. And confidence, I see, is a doing thing. You know, we're all, we're all confident in something. But so many students come to me and they're like, I haven't got any confidence. And we help to think, well, firstly, what are you confident in? And when we, all I see confidence is, is when our mind is really, really quiet and peaceful. And the problem with personal development, I find, is that if I'm, oh, okay, I'm not feeling confident, I need to do loads of tools and strategies and like add more noise into my brain and that will boost my confidence. Whereas actually I see it's coming from a place of stillness of when our minds are quiet. Like if I was about to dance in front of you, my mind would be racing. I'm not going to, by the way, you'd be pleased to know. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> my mind would be racing at like a thousand miles an hour and I'd be stressed. I'd be nervous. And it's not because I'm not, I don't see myself as a confident dancer. It's just, there's so much noise up here. So when we help students to see that confidence is like, you've all got confidence. You just got to turn down the noise, mm -hmm. really connect with what you, you know, what do you love doing and, and just comparing it to that because yeah, it's about taking action and, and doing that one thing you fear. But I like I said, I really believe confidence is just a quiet mind. You know, think less, do more, which is really important for me personally to think about. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I've not heard of that before. And it is the noise. That's It's the noise in the head that gives so many people anxiety, isn't it? Because you've got that constant chatter, that little monkey brain. Never yeah, it's, mm, yeah, it's right. And then putting a strategy, you know, working with anxious students sometimes. They love this approach. Yeah. It's almost like it's sort of a bit of acceptance and commitment therapy in some ways, which is a great, it's called ACT, um, which is kind of accepting things that are thoughts basically and seeing them as not actual facts. And that's the biggest problem that we face. Like this last week, I had the thought that the school doesn't want it and I, I feel rejected. And then I, as soon as I see that as reality, we attach emotion to it. My emotion was like frustration, anger, pain, hurt. And it led me my actions then. I was just like pretty miserable, pretty down. Yeah. So helping students to see that their thoughts are not reality or not your thinking helps them to distance themselves from it and not attach emotion to certain things. And then by doing that, they're more sort of neutral. It's like they're not driving in a high gear that's going to burn the car out. It's just kind of just staying there, if that makes sense, in, in a neutral position. Um, and it really helped Jamie because Jamie went through counseling, the student I was talking about earlier. So many strategies, deep breathing, like timelines of the past, all this stuff. And we had basically just said like, what would be different if we just saw it as thinking? And he was like, it sounds simple. And it is simple. He was like, oh my God, well, then I wouldn't feel all this pressure and this stuff to, to be a certain way and to, and to do certain things. So we crave strategies. This confidence thing and this thinking, it's not necessarily a strategy. It's just being okay with whatever shows up. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I suppose, yeah, that little voice in your head is not you. And I've heard mm. people before personify it as well, give them, give it an identity. So like, you know, being like, oh God, Sheila's going at it again. <laughs> and now <I'm laughs> Sheila chatting yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. Is that your one, Sheila? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Shazza. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that. And I, another thing I heard about um, confidence as well was that, when you start showing up for yourself and you start showing yourself you you can do what you say you're going to do then you start to build confidence in yourself so imagine going through your program they start seeing what they can do when you go through the believe stage and they see what they can do they see what they're capable of and that helps to reinforce the confidence oh my days massively appreciate what you just said um another quote that i use which is one of my favorite quotes of all time by Gandhi, it says, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Yeah. I usually use this at talks. It's like, when I say to kids, kids, hands up, like how many of you think you're gonna revise? You'll say to your parents you're gonna revise, 
but then you end up binging Netflix for eight hours. Right, you're not in harmony. And you know, if you think you're gonna watch Netflix, say you're gonna watch Netflix and you watch Netflix, then amazing, congrats, like you are in a perfect place because you're living what you're saying. And helping students to see that you've got to follow through on your actions. And actually, obviously, when we coach, it's like, what do you want to do? So they think about, well, I might put, let's use an example, anxious, year seven girl, very quiet, let's say. She can't find her voice. Um, her action might, so she might think, I'm going to put my hand out once a day. She'll tell me, and I'll also tell her parents, because we get them accountable like that, that she's going to put her hand out once a day. And then because of that, she ends up following through on the action more, even though she's a bit scared, she knows it's going to help her grow. So she puts her hand up in that scary lesson. Now that might not seem a lot to many people, but for that girl, it's a massive deal, physically putting your hand up and saying, hey, I wanna talk now, it's big. But she's sticking to her truth. She's sticking to what she wants to think and say. And it means she is in harmony with her life. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, love it. Love what you just said, um, think, say, do, it's so important. Yeah, and the more you can grow that in children, the better it will be when they're adults because you like as adults we're still learning this we're we're still those people who say we're going to do something and then binge watch netflix for eight hours yeah. <laughs> oh yeah no it's better oh, god i i love everything you do um so obviously i i work a lot in the world of mental health and mental health within children is a huge issue at the moment and also emotional health um which are two very separate things as well what have you found in schools? You mentioned there was a lot of anxi anxiety was one of the challenges. How have you found dealing with all the mental health side of it? Yeah, like, you know, everyone's got mental health. You know, it's really important that we recognise that, that everyone's got mental health, like everyone's got physical health. Um, and even if you, our programme isn't necessarily for people who are even struggling. It's just for people just to gain life skills and feel better about themselves. Um, but that's why we do these tools, you know, like, again, like we might not just because you're boosting someone emotionally, like the link to their academics is important. And then once there's their grades start improving, then they feel better about themselves as well. You know? Um, but how do I, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really say because everything we've talked about so far is mental health. Mm. And what we do is help students with that, you know, become develop resilient mental health mm. basically in a nutshell. So yeah, there's no, there's no challenge too great. Like I said, the Jamie one. That suicide one was the biggest challenge I've ever, ever had to deal with as a coach, as a human being, I'd say. Mm. Um, but that was, you know, again, like, does our program work? Well, yeah, it does. And we get results for every single student we work with. So, yeah, it's really, it's really fun. And working with the primary school students is even is, is really fun as well, the younger ones, because they haven't had the weight of secondary school. So like crush them their mental health is different because usually it's, it's about rejection it's about like well he said something mean to me in the playground or my friends i'm not you know, thinking of my friends and it's a lot of relationships for them but again giving them some tools and skills to really to really help them with that from a young age um and i think that's where we need to start as well is is more primary school mm -hmm. then these challenges when they come to secondary school aren't as aren't as mega because we're all going to experience challenges i'm not saying you work with student breakthrough here's the magic wand you're never going to have a mental health challenge again like we all have mental health we all go through our own challenges but if we can skill people up to deal with them effectively then you know rebecca, rebecca they're not going to have to you know you don't have to see them necessarily when they're an adult and they've got all this baggage that they're, they're dealing with because they've dealt with it from a younger age mm -hmm. yeah exactly and building the resilience and is, is a huge part of what you do. Yeah. What, what kind of tools do you use in terms of, um, I'm not going to go into too much depth about your package and that, but in, in terms of what tools do you find that work with primary school children in helping building their confidence and mental health? Yeah, great question. We, my brother was a year one teacher, so he taught for five-year-olds. So my program was made for secondary school students. And I'd go to Ben and I'd be like, Ben, here's my secondary school, uh, you know, exercise or tool. How can we adapt it for the younger ones? So one of the great ones, it's all a bit more interactive. So we'll do stuff, moving around the room, creating stuff, visualizing stuff. Um, one of the greatest ones is that tree of life exercise, which is so creative. So we use the tree as a metaphor for our lives. You know, if a tree stops growing, if we stop growing, then we're not going to feel very happy. If a tree stops growing, you know, it might not, it might die, whatever like that. But, 
we've got to keep growing. We've got to keep moving forward with our lives. So the tree of life, we did a great exercise called the big school breakthrough with year six is going into year seven. So I teamed up with a mindfulness coach, but for my bit, we did some, we did the tree of life. So we looked at their values. Um, you know, when we help students identify the values, like in anything um, around values, they can start aligning themselves to that. They can start saying, well, I value honesty. I value, I value truth. Um, I value my family or whatever it is. And they can start really appreciating what makes them special. Mm-hmm. And then the trunk on the tree is strengths. So you've got ask, you know, asking primary school students, what are you skilled at? What are your strengths? And they're writing this down. And again, it's just great self-esteem boosting. The branches on the tree are like hopes, goals, and dreams. So what do they want to achieve? At that age, it's like, I want to be a footballer. I want to be an astronaut. And it's like, amazing, cool, write it down. So we're kind of visualizing. It's a bit like a vision board. Yeah. Leaves on the tree are their skills and their interests. So these are like five things they love doing. So if they're feeling low, it's a bit of self-care, right? If you're feeling low, but you love horse riding, go and do some horse riding. You're going to feel better about yourself, right? You're going to change your state. Mm-hmm. And then the fruits on the trees are my favorite questions. The first one is what are two things you've achieved so far in your life? The second one, what do other people appreciate about you? So this whole thing is on a sheet of A3 and they put up in the room as a visual poster, a reminder. And imagine being an 11 year old and working on your values, what your strengths are, what you want to do as a job, what your skills are self care and what do people appreciate about you and having that visually to look at every day. Like, and then we did some mindfulness afterwards and it was just like an amazing session. Mm-hmm. So it's really creative basically, but uh, we give kids those visual reminders, you know, why are you awesome? What makes you amazing? Mm-hmm. Stick it up on the wall, look at that every day. That's awesome. I want to do that as an adult. <laughs> as I've got one on my wall. Yeah. I've got one on my wall, do it. It's amazing. Um, on a recent online course, it was session two. So I can send you the link, Rebecca. You can do it. <laughs> I'll, um, <laughs> it was session two of the online course, um, which was, had its own challenges. You know, how do, we, how do we coach students without actually physically being there? That was a challenge. Um, but we included that one because, again, it's such great for students, it's so great for students' self esteem and their self worth to do an exercise like that. Um, again, if you ask an adult what your five strengths, don't adults find that hard, which is like blows my mind. And that says a lot about what they faced growing up and how they view themselves. Um, and I'm not saying if you haven't got five strengths, like you should feel bad about that. But it's funny when we ask, it's a classic interview question, isn't it? And people are like, you know, I, don't, I don't know. And your five strengths don't have to be like coaching kids or working in mental health. It can just be like, you know, one of my strengths, I'm a great friend. Like I really check in on my friends. Um, I am a really supportive son. You know, they don't have to be like really big things or, you know, one of my strengths, I, lo- I love exercising. Yeah. One of your strengths can be watching Netflix. Like that's your strength and you love Netflix. And Nail crap. that. <laughs> Nail it. You know, like I'm not one of these people that says you've got to be positive all the time. You know, you got to change your life. You know, all this kind of rhetoric that some people talk about. Like there's always positives and negatives. And I think just appreciating and accepting that is massive because mental health is not about being positive. And I feel last week I was, you know, I was doing that to an extent. I was like, I feel like a victim. I feel frustrated and I want to be positive, but it took me a while. And this is me, right? I've done a lot of self work. So I'm not saying I'm a guru and expert. Um, but looking back, it was then like, oh, man, maybe I just got to, you know, slow down a little bit and just, that's okay. You know, there's always gonna be good days and bad days, but it's just accepting your emotions, accepting your thoughts yeah and being okay with it i think i was having this conversation the other um the other day where it's it's very easy to look at someone else and say they've got it all together like they you know they're doing this they they've got their life all made up but then you have that insight into yourself where you see all of it. You see the messy stuff. You see the, the stuff that doesn't want to get out of bed or you see the stuff that is, feels really lazy and whatever. But on the outside, you see everyone's not like that. You see them as one person who's got it together. And so it's mm. hard to kind of come to that place where you accept that everyone is just winging it and everyone is just kind of putting their life together the best way they can. Yeah, so true. I never put anyone on a pedestal. I used to. Like when I watch people speak on stage, you'll be like, oh my God, I want to be like that person. But we're all the same. We're all going through our own challenges. Um, and everyone's challenges is, are personal to them. But that's why vulnerability is so important. Like on social media, I'm not saying I tell students and every, the world all my deepest, darkest secrets. But I'll tell people I'm not feeling good. I'll tell people what's happening to me. Um, 
because no one's got their, their stuff like totally together. You know, everyone, like I said, everyone's facing the challenges and helping students, right? To see that, well, Sam's necessarily not feeling that great today makes them really, really connect with that it's okay to not be okay, but also to have the awareness that we're always self-correcting mm. and life always improves. I say this all the time, like if you look back on your life, connect the dots, some challenges you've had to face and overcome, you realize that you're always going to adapt. You're always going to change and you're always going to you know, survive, right? Survival instincts. You're always going to get over that challenge of what you're going through at the moment. And it's temporary as well. So it's going to pass, but being vulnerable with students and I'm always vulnerable in the first session. Cause it's like, if Sam's telling me his story, if he's being vulnerable and open, then I can share as well. So it's about people actually showing them who you are. are You're a real human being or are you this kind of guru, the positive expert that's got it all together? Like a social media star that <laughs> that everything is perfect <laughs> yeah. i love that I lo- and i love that self-correcting you've mentioned it a few times and it's so true that's so it's like being a captain on a ship like if i'm a captain on a ship and i'm not a sailor by the way so you'll probably excuse me if you are a sailor but like with a different change of wind direction you just tack and by tacking you just move your sail to one side of the ship and then you go in this direction and then you're going to face another challenge and you've got to keep tacking and tacking and tacking and who knows where it's going to go. And that's the exciting thing. It's being, it's being comfortable with the uncertainty that you've got no direction. But everything is always on the way. Nothing is ever in the way. Like what is, your challenges are there for you, I feel. To help you grow and help you learn, and help you take a new direction if you need to. And you're always going to get through it. And having that belief means that when you are a failure, when you feel like a failure, you feel like a victim. Like obviously sit in that place, feel the emotion but it'll help you overcome it faster because you know that you can overcome it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you, I suppose when you take on the idea that failure is part of success, failure just becomes information rather than mm. actually failing. Yes. Yeah, feedback. I think I've heard that before. The failure is just feedback. Mm. It's just information. Mm. So my last question for you before we um, tell everyone where they can find you is, I, uh, you well, no, I, everything I do in wellbeing and mental health is about giving people information and tools that they can use so that they can take their wellbeing and happiness back into their own two hands. So it's empowering people that they can look after themselves and, and they have so much more control over their mental and emotional health than they think. So my one question for you would be, what is your one key takeaway that you would give people that they can put in action today? to improve their emotional and mental health? Great question. For me, one thing that's really helped me is the quote that failure is a blessing. And there's two little strategies to, to engage with this. So when you had a really a rubbish day or something hasn't gone your way, I asked myself this lots last week. This first question is what can I learn from this? So when you're feeling a little bit down, ask yourself, go upstream upstream with your emotions. What can I learn from this? What's going on that I can take away? And then the second one is how can I use this knowledge? So what can I learn from this? How can I use this knowledge? And I say that because if I'd engaged with my failure, the army, like we spoke about at the start, it would have saved me so much pain and so much upset and just hurt if I'd actually engaged with the failure. So not necessarily a failure, just when you want to learn something or just reflect, what can I learn and how can I use this in the future? When you do that, you'll start embracing your setbacks and those challenges will become not so massive and significant for you. I love that. Thank you so much for that. Now, before we do the Maui habit, which I always love, where can people find you and follow you if you want more information? Yeah, thank you. Um, So people can connect with Student Breakthrough on Facebook and Instagram, which is just at Student Breakthrough. On LinkedIn, I'm Sam Moine, which is M-O-I-N-E-T. And our website is studentbreakthrough.com. But yeah, come and come and like see what we do, see what we post, reach out if you need any support, um, because I'm here to help as many people as possible. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. And there are some really, really good videos on his website on LinkedIn as well. So I really do recommend you check them out. Now, every time at the end of my podcast, I always do the Maui habit. And now that I have wonderful company with me. Sam is going to join me in doing that as well today. <laughs> so everyone who put your feet on the ground, I want you to roll your shoulders back and take a deep breath. 
and I want you to say, today is going to be a great day. Go on, Sam. <laughs> today is going to be a great day. Yeah. Being positive affirmations. Yeah, it's funny. It. As soon as you say that, you cannot, you can't not smile. No, it's true. And it's like that um, Buddhist smile they talk about, where you just do a little curvature of the lips, and it just makes you feel a little bit better, like yeah. straight away. I love that. The yeah. day is going to be a great, a great day. day. Say it every morning when you get out of bed, put your feet on the floor and say it. So Amazing. Nice. Love that. Thank you, Becca. Thank you so much, Sam. It has been incredible talking to you. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing this video and. Please subscribe if you want to join us on more videos. We've got many more podcasts to come. I look forward to chatting to you next time. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>